Hey everyone, welcome, welcome back to Learn Computing with Daniel Bullen, with me, Daniel Bullen. And then, so, are you, are you gearing up for your GCSE Computer Science Paper 2 exam? Paper, well if you are, the video we're going to go through today is Paper 2 of the Edexcel IGCSC Pass Paper for 2023. So yes. If you're looking for NXL IGCSE Paper 2 2023, you come to the right place. Learn Computing with Daniel Bullen. So in this video, I'm going to do a deep dive into the Paper 2, covering all of the covering all of the key topics, tips, and strategies you need to ace that exam. Whether you're looking to boost your grade or you just need a refresher, stick around as we unravel how to master. Paper 2 of the Edexcel IGCSE exam. But before I do, please, please remember to click that like and subscribe bell to get notifications on the next video. And also, and also share this video far and wide. And let's get right into it. So, we need to answer questions requiring a written answer in the spaces provided. Some questions must be answered with a cross. So basically all the yada, yada, yada. So in paper two, NXL, IGCSE, it's a programming paper. So we need to pick one programming language throughout the exam. So in this case, we're gonna cross the, we're gonna cross for Python. Okay, let's get right into it. Programs are stored. Programs are used to handle financial transactions. So you've got a monthly account statement created by the program. So we got figure one, which shows the entire statement. We need to complete the table to identify an input, output, and a process used by a program, by a program to generate the furthest right column. So you've got your input, you've got your processing, and then there, here is your output. Okay, so, An input I would have, we would need to think, well, the output is obviously going to be the balance. Description, that could be your processing potentially. So here's just some of the answers. So we've got debit, card, or description. So you could have debit, card, or description for one mark. When we are processing, that is where we're gonna, it's gonna be the balance plus the credit. And then the output is obviously gonna be, we wanna output the balance. Or we might wanna output the description. But in this case, we wanna output the balance. Okay? So by doing something like this, you could have debit, you could have debit, you could just have a debit there, or you could have a credit, or you could have balance, but I'm going to go with debit as our input. Processing, we're going to add the balance to the credit, and then the output's going to be the actual balance. Okay. Or you could have divide, or you could have balance minus debit. Or you can have minus balance minus debit. Job done. Okay, that's your three marks. Ooh. Okay, let's get into the next one. Question Q01B. So we're gonna tax rate as applied to a gross value to give a net value. So you need to open Q01B in the code editor. And we're gonna use the code to answer the questions. So this is where we're not actually going to be doing anything which is a first in a question like this. But anyway, so we need to use the code. So we need to give the contents of a comment. So what they mean by the contents of a comment will be something that is literally the contents of a comment. If you were to say something like, this is 5%. That's all you need to say, that's the humor mark. 
just for reading what it says. Okay. Next one. Identify a logical operator used in the program. So the logical operator is going to be an OR. Because you've got the OR down here, that's your logical operator. Next one. We need to give a name of a global variable. So a global variable you'll find outside of the subroutine. So you could have, you can have gross amount, or you can have net amount. Yep, gross amount, net amount, done. Okay, next one, give the name of a constant. So the constant in this case is going to be tax. And then what we'll need to, and then next one, give the name of a parameter. So we go in gross, and it's going to return the net like that. So you can have net, or, it, or you could even have in gross. Where we, yep, so you got in gross. That's your parameter. And then we're doing ingross times one minus the tax, which is 0 0.05. So we could have ingross. Okay. Let's move on. Variables and constants are used in program code. So you state the purpose of a constant. So the purpose of a constant is actually going to be to store a value that will not change. So tax is a constant, so it's going to store the value that's not going to change at all. And then one benefit of a constant is we can change the number once. So I can change to 0 0.04, which is 4%, rather than doing 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, lots of times. I only need to do it once. I know tax is only there once, but a constant's good. If say you had this code much bigger and the constant's used lots of times, you only have to do a change once. Yep. And also you're gonna have the value needs to be changed in one place, like I've said. It's easy to understand the logic and it, and it can make the code more efficient. So I've literally said the second one which will get you one mark, no problem. So that is question one. Question two. Solutions to problems are made up of many different components. So programmers use subprograms when developing code. So we need to give two reasons to use subprogram libraries when you develop code. So the two reasons, the code in a library has already been debugged. It's already been tested. That would be one mark. And with subprogram libraries, they may, libraries can include specialized functions. Okay. So if I was to, so we could have, choosing the answers from the mark scheme, so you could say, the code in a library has already been debugged, so we don't have to do any of that unnecessary debugging. And you could also say may include specialized functions. That's literally it. Okay, identify which one of these must return a result. It's going to be a function. It's not going to be... And the way I would do it is process of elimination. It's not selection. That's if and else and elifs. It's not going to be a procedure. Because a procedure, while callable, doesn't return a result. It's not going to be iteration because that is to do with loops. Uh, so we're left with a function. Okay. 
Okay, next one. What's a local variable? So a local variable is going to be a variable that's accessible only in one subprogram in which it's created. So you won't be able to use it anywhere else. And that's that. Right, so we've got 2B I. The school is planning a fish and chip dinner for the students and their families. Tickets are only sold to families. Family is one of four adults and one to six children. So a program's been written to help manage ticket sales. So we need to complete the table to show examples of normal, boundary, and erroneous numeric data to the program. So for adults, so if we think about it, family is one to four adults and one to six children. So we have to think about that. So in here, you, would li you can literally say one, two, three, or four. Okay? One, two, three, or four. And then in here, it's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six. Done. That's normal. Boundary is going from one extreme to the other. So in this case, it's going to be one and four. One being the lowest, four being the highest. And then for the kiddies, it's going to be one to six. Erroneous, however, is going to be if it's lower than one or bigger than four. Or we're going to have lower than one or more than six. So you get one mark for one row for one row. Okay. So that's 2A part one. So let's have a look. Yep. So we've got that right, so that's three marks in a bag. Okay, so the kitchen staff use a program to determine whether they have enough chips or how many more they need to order. So this is where we need to go into the code editor now. So we need to go back into coding. So we're going to take this and we're going to bung it in here. Okay, so we need to have a look at this code and correct any of the errors. Okay, that's what the code's asking us to do. Okay, so we need to correct any errors and then we're going to use the test data to help you find them. So I can see there's an error. Required weight is going to be weight of an adult plus the weight of a child. That's one error done. Okay. That's one error done. And then what we need to do is we need to go looking in the code where that needs to be. So we change the plus equals plus equals to a plus, so that's one mark. So now we want to change the greater than to less than or equal to, that's two. And then what we want to do is we want to change the weight in stock. So we want the change we've got in stock. So we need to do weight need so it's going to equal to in stock. We don't want to take it away. So we need to change the order of subtraction. So we don't want it in that order. So we want required weight. And we want to take away in stock. So we're telling the staff how much more to order in kilograms. And we don't want it to be a zero. What we want, 
we want it to be 1000. Okay. So now we're going to do 1900, 150. So we're going to do 1900, 150, 19,000. So we know stocks are available as our expected output. Now we're going to do 15, 100, and 150. 15, 100, 150. So we're saying, right, this is how many is, is available. That's how many is required. And this is how many more we need to order. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is question two. To be part two. Okay. Now, on to the next bit. Number three. Algorithms can be represented in flowcharts, pseudocode, or program code. Trace tables, we can use those with flowcharts or pseudocodes. Pseudocodes. So we need to give two characteristics of a trace table. So the way this would work would be this. So in each one, so in each one, we're going to have each column. So you could say something like each column represents an output, an output. That's one characteristic. And then another one is where values are manually filled out. Yep, so I've set that a little bit differently to the mark scheme, but you would still get two marks nonetheless. Okay? Next one. An algorithm has been written to validate the numbers entered by a user. So this is where it gets a little bit harder. So we need to complete the table to show the output for each set of inputs. So you're 88 and 18 as your number one and number two. And 18. So number one is, it's definitely going to be, yeah, if number is less than 16 and it's less than 23, well, it's none of those. Or number two, 13, it's going to be none of those. So we're going to go in the else. And that's going to state. So we're going to go into state two. 17 and 18? Nope. But yes. So it's going to go into state 1. Or number 13. But it's not. So, we're, so it's not going to go into state 1. It's not going to do state 2. It's not going to do 3. So we're going to go into state 4. 12 and 19? Less than 12? Well, number 13, so it's going to be state 1. And let's have a look. Yep, that'll be three marks in the back there. So state 2, state 4, state 1. Like up here. So if it's less than 16, and less than 23, or, less than or equal to 13. It's not, it's not 13, it's not less than 23. It's less than 16, no. So I'm going to be in state one. Okay. Let's go to the next one. Now, we've got a program that's required to calculate the result of raising one integer to the power of another. So we've got a flow chart of the program, which is a pretty big one. So we've got your start terminal, you've got your process, and then you've got your input. And we're going to see, is it equal to decision? Is it equal to zero? If yes, we're just going to stop. If not, we're going to enter a value from exponent. Is that negative? If it's a yes, error message. Then we go back and do it all over again. If it is, 
Now set answer to 1 and then set count to 0. Is the count less than the exponent? If not, we're going to go inform the user result and go back. Is it more? Yes, it is. So we just go around in a loop. So the program has these requirements. So it needs to output a meaningful error message and output the final answer with the base and the exponent. So in Q03C, we need to write a program to implement the logic of the flow chart. And only that and no more. Okay. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is we need to do base is naught, and then we need to do exponent, that's going to be naught, and then we are going to do, and then we are going to do answer is equal to one. Okay, that's all we need to do. That's all we need, so that's what we got so far. And then we need to do a base where we're going to get the first number. So it's going to ask us, enter the base of that number, and it's going to be an integer. And I'm going to keep asking the, I'm going to keep asking for that number until it's entered. So we want to check if the user wants to exit. So we need a while loop. Okay. And then in that while loop, we need to get we need to get the exponent. Okay, so we gotta get the exponent now. So we want to get the exponent that they're gonna type in. And then we want to check if it's a negative. And if it's a negative, it's gonna say invalid one entered okay so we've checked to see if it's negative and then what we want to do after that is else i'm going to do and i'm going to reset the answer we're going to reset the answer to equal one, and then we're going to calculate the exponentation using the four count. So we're going to reset it, we're going to use the four count, we're going to get the answer up and going. Okay, so let's give this a go. So indentation error, Y is on line 31, so a couple of mistakes we've made there. Okay, so let's see where the mistakes were, shall we? So what I should have done there was in the else. So I got the if and the else in the loop. Done the calculation. And done the print. So, should really have done that. So, enter a number, and it enters zero. Nope, nothing happens here. So, I'm going to enter another number, two, zero. So, two to the power of naught is one, two to the power of two, two times two, four, two to the power of three, eight. 32 2 to the power of 3. So 2 times 2 is 4. Times 2 is 8. Right. Right. 2 times 2 is 4. Times 2 is 8. Times 2 is 16. Right. So let's try again. 2 to the power of 3. Right. Because it keeps adding and adding and adding. So I'm going to try it again. So we're going to do 2 to the power of 3 is 8. The problem is, if I kept on adding more, it's going to add up again and again and again. Okay? So that is essentially that flowchart.
So we've implemented this very flowchart in Python. OK. So that is that. OK. Next one, question four. Yep, 4B, we will get another one, another coding question like this, because it is a Python paper. So, data is encoded for encryption and identifying records in databases. A Caesar cipher is one such method. So we need to complete the table to show the result of a Caesar cipher. So this is all about shifting. So we're shifting this as minus 4. So we're going to do p minus 4. So that's going to be a k i. So we've got i. h, g, f, e. x. So, so we've got x. So w. V, U, T, E, that's going to go to A, then L, it's going to go to H. Let's have a look. It's not going to go into all that. Nearly got it. I should have had an L and not a K. So that's why I've miscounted. So we've got to be careful when we're counting. Okay? Let's try cloud. C, D, E, D, E, and F. That's going to be a ship three. And yep, I've got that. So it's a ship three. So if you, unless you get this right, you're not going to get marks. But at least we've got that nonetheless. Plain text is encrypted using Caesar cipher. We need to compare the cipher text produced for the plain text gold by a shift of minus six followed by a shift of plus eight, which looks like a bloody difficult one to do. So we're going to have a practical explanation. Or you could have a theory explanation. So you could say both produce the same result because the shift of, of minus 6 is followed by plus 8 is the same as the shift of plus 2. So you could say that. Or you can have the practical explanation where you've got gold. Minus 6 is going to be eighths, which is going to be a shift of 8. IQNF, which is going to be, is going to be IQNF. Or you could have gold plus 2. Which is IQ and F, which is going to be plus two. So any of these ways will get you two marks. If you don't feel comfortable doing the second one, don't worry about it. You can always say both will produce the same result because minus six is followed by plus eight. You might as well just do plus two at this point. Okay? So don't worry about doing that. No one's asking it to do that. Okay, this one. Anna's written a Caesar cipher algorithm. So when the algorithm encrypts the plain text byte with a shift of plus five, the result is GVYJ. Ooh. So that's incorrect. So we need to explain the error. So the letter. Y has not been encrypted correctly, as the letter V 
That's the letter V. Because plus 5. So that's one mark. And that's because the plus 5 shift did not roll over the end of the alphabet correctly. So that would be the error in the answer. So if we were to do B, it'd be C, D, E, and F. So be a shift of four. So be a shift of five, actually. Okay. So that is literally it there. Okay. Next bit, a program is needed to create a key for a database. A user enters a two-letter word, a whole number, and a decimal number. The program must ensure the word is only two characters long. The program must display an error message when the word is not two characters long. So a key generated from the whole number, the reversed word, and the whole number part of the decimal number. So this is where we need Q04B. So we need to write a program that does what figure four is doing and nothing else. So how are we going to tackle this one? Okay, so in other words, this program is we have to enter a word, enter a whole number, enter a decimal number, and this is the output. So we need to code exactly that and no more. But let's see how to do it, shall we? Sitting around talking about it? Get us marks, it will not. To do it, get us marks, it will. So we need to take a two letter word as our input. So we're gonna do my word equals input, enter a two letter word. That's the first bit. And then we will then need to check if the word is two letters long. So what that means is I'm going to do if len my word is not equal to two. We're going to not print invalid input. We are going to check. We're going to take the whole number as an input. So we're going to do a variable called my num, and it's going to ask us to enter a whole number, which is all we need. And then what we need is we need to reverse the letters in the word. So reverse letters in the word. So what we're going to do there is we're going to do a variable called new word, and we're going to call it my word. And we're going to add my word index zero. And then we are going to find the whole, whole number part of the decimal number. So this is where we're going to use casting. So we're going to say my whole equals int my decimal. Okay. So what I should have done. So what I should have done there was done another variable where we're going to take a decimal number, which is why it's not, which is why there is no my decimal variable there. Now that I've put that in, the error's gone. So, we now need to create a new key. So now we need to create a new key. So that new key is going to be my key, and that's going to be equals string my num. And we're going to add new word. We're going to add string my whole. And then we're going to display. And then we are going to display 
the new key. For the user, and we're going to print my key. Okay. Else, otherwise, we're going to have invalid word entered. Okay. Let's have a look and see that in action. So, we enter a two letter word. Hello, I'm going to do two, I'm going to do 3.2. That's not going to work because what I should have done here was I should have done that as a float and asked the user to enter a decimal. So in later tasks like this, if you get some of it working, you will get marks. If you get all of it working, you're obviously going to get marks. If you don't, still attempt it, because you can still get some marks. And there we go. So that is our answer. Just done a random test, but I'm going to test at 12.87.89. So remind me. So this could be at 12, at 12, right. So at doesn't want doesn't want to play. So I should say at right, invalid word entered. Okay. So what I should have done there at what was the next one? Twelve seven point eighty nine. 12TA7. Have we got that? Bosh. Done. Lovely. So we've made the program do that. So we've got a full eight marks, ladies and gentlemen. Number five. A marine scientist is conducting a study of tuna in the world's oceans. A list of tuna species needs to be sorted in descending order. In alphabetical order. Using the merge sort algorithm. So each, so figure five shows the list created at the end of the splitting process. Each list is a single tuna species. It's going to require three passes to merge the list into a single sorted list in descending order, and we need to complete the merge sort using this space provided. So I'm going to show you how they would do it in the mark scheme. So you can just see basically. So this is how we would do. They would do it. So, we've got blackfin, big eye, long tail, albacore, bluefin. As we see, so we've done one sort here. And then we're sorting all of this with the bluefin. And then we are doing descending. So we're going from L to A. So you've got blackfin, big eye, long tail, albacore, bluefin. That's the first one. And then we're going to merge long tail, black fin, big eye, albacore. So they're in reverse alphabetical order, and we're left with the blue fin. So the blue fin needs to be in index one. And that is one sorted, that is one algorithm sorted. And this is one of the correct merge sorts you could have. Or you could have, or you could have this, or you could sort it like this. You've got big eye, black fin, albacore, long tail, blue fin. Separate the big eye from the other four. And it's still going to be, and the output, sorted output, is going to be exactly the same. Okay? So that is literally it for that. So there's lots of possible solutions. Part B. A bubble sort could also be used to sort the list of tuna species in ascending order. So we got a bubble sort this time, the bubble sort algorithm being shown in this pseudocode. But there's an error in the loop between line 9 and 16. So we need to complete the table to get the line number with the error and the corrected line of pseudocode. 
So we know the, the error is going to be line 11. Okay. So we need to put the correct line in its place. So rather than set TMP to my tuner, NDX plus one, it's going to be set TMP to my tuner. And it's just going to be NDX. We don't need the plus one. We're just doing the index first. And then we can do that later. And then we can bring in the plus one when we set my tuner index to set out to the index increment by one. Okay. That's that done. See, the scientist is collecting and storing data about tuna. Data is collected by species, length in centimeters, weight in kilograms, age in years. Okay, so we've got quite a lot there. So we're storing that in an array. The collected data has got, to, needs to be written to a file called tunadata.txt with each record stored in the file having a code there. So the code numbers have to start at 101. And this is the contents of the file we're going to be dealing with. So we need to write the program that outputs this file, basically. And we have to use the structure given. And no more. So this is, this is the data we've been given. So now, what do we do next? So we would need file file out equals tunadata.txt and we're going to append that to right to the right mode. Then we're going to do a constant called comma and I'm just going to pass a comma into that. Then we're going to do line feed is going to be 101 and then we're going to do line out which is going to be empty strings okay so now we want to do file open tunadata.txt and all we want which we don't need this time because we've already declared that so we just want to call that oops, file out and all we want to do is just write so now we want for tuna in table tuna and then what we want to do now is we want to start with the number with a comma so we want to start number With comma. So I'm going to do line out equals string number plus comma. Then we want to add the name of the tuner and the comma. So I should have had right. I know what I've done wrong there. Line feed should have been backslash n, and then I should have done number initialized to 101, which is why my number one didn't appear. Why my number one had an would have had an error otherwise. But let's get back to that. So we need to add the name of the tuner and a comma. So we're going to have line. Line out equals line out plus tuna index zero plus the comma. So we're adding in the constant again. So each of the numbers will then need to be converted to a string before adding to the output. Okay.
So we will need the line out. So we're going to need line out, which we've got, which is line increment the line out in index one plus a comma. There's going to be the same with index two. There's going to be the same with index three. But you'll notice in line index three, there's no comma in the last line field. So then we will need to add a line field to the whole line and then write the line to the file and then go to the next number where we're incremented by one then close the file. So let's have a look. So there's nothing there because we've got a potential error going on here, which is on line 22. Even though I got file out. Let's try this one now. So what's going to happen is it's going to output the tune of data file. And yes, it will take a lot. Yes, it does take time to do. But sometimes that can just be the server play, REPL server play in that. So I'm going to try something else. So what you can get, so this is essentially the code. So when we run it, we haven't asked it to print out anything, which is why we're not seeing anything. But if we have a look in the file, it's printing out the contents that we will have wanted. So this is the contents of the file where the code numbers have to start at 101 which in this case it does so yeah in this one it doesn't talk about having to print it or output the whole thing okay so you don't actually need to do that and i'll show you the mark scheme to show that you don't Right, Java, and this is our Python one. This is our code. These are the these are the code we've used. Then we've done the file out. Going through all of these, so you can see that there's no print statement that's going to output the contents of the file in that column. So, A11 also well, says outputted information is fit for purpose for the audience. It's outputted in the file, but it's not outputted in the terminal. And there's no code that they want you to put that indicates that. So like I say, in a, like I say, in a, you know, in a question like that, you're not expected to output it. You're just expected to do what you're going to do. So we've appended the file. One complete written to, line written to a file should include individual elements. Complete the file must be expected, so no, no additional stuff. So it's saying not to add any additional stuff, so we're sorted. Right, question six. We're on the last stretch. This is a big one now. So we're going to agricultural college as a herd of dairy cows. Data collected for the cows is stored in arrays. So we got name of the breed, ease of care rating for that breed, one being the highest, three the lowest, number of cows in the herd that, of that breed, volume of milk per day for a cow of that breed. So the college wants the data presented to farmers and recommend the best breed, to, breed of cows for them. Best breed has the highest care rating and the largest volume of milk a day for a cow of that breed. So we need to open question six in the code editor, where we're going to get a program. This is where the output is going to look like this. So we need to calculate the daily volume of milk produced by each breed. Add this volume to the data structure, TBL daily volume. Display a message informing the user what each field holds. 
like the breed, rating, volume for cow, count and total volume, and display the data for each breed. So we're going to calculate and display the total volume of milk produced each day by the herd. Find a recommended breed and display the breed by name. So this is what we've got in the program. So we basically need to make this program. So it should function correctly even if the number of breeds represented in the date has changed. Which is going to be a bit of a big one. But nothing that we can't handle. So we've got number six. This is the skeleton code which we need. So we need to write our code here. Right, how are we going to write that? So we would need index is zero. Then we're going to need a total volume. It's going to be 0, 0.0. And then we're going to need max index also a zero. Okay, so once we've got the max index, we need to do a print statement that's going to say something like fields are. Fields are breed rating volume, daily volume. So we've got breed rating. We don't need count, we just need volume. So it's going to be volume. And it's going to be per cow. Then it's going to be, then we're going to have count. And then we're going to have daily volume. And what we mean by daily volume, we're going to have, so we've got volume for cow, count, vo you could say daily volume, or you could just have volume a day. Okay, and then we're going to need four index in range, and it's going to be the length of TBL breed. So we need to calculate the volume per day. Okay, then we need to do today volume, and that's going to be TBL. TBL count index, and we're going to times up by the vo TBL volume index. And then we're going to add today's volume to the daily volume table. Okay, and then what we're going to do is we're going to do TBL daily volume, and we're going to append that to the today volume and then what we're going to do we're going to display the we're going to display the row of information for this breed and then what we're going to do after that we're going to do we're going to print table breed so we're going to print the breed the rating the volume the count. So we've got breed, rating, volume, count, and the daily volume. Okay, so that is what we're going to print out. Okay, and then we need to keep a running total of the milk production. And to, and to decode that, we need total volume is total volume plus the today volume. And then what, the next bit we're going to do, we're going to do the task for best breed. So it's going to be test. So we're going to test for a best breed. And then what we're going to do. It's going to be if table rating. So we're going. So we've got if 
table rating index is less than the table rating index with the maximum index in there and the table volume is more than or equal to the table volume. So we're going to set the max index to the index and then we're going to display the total volume of milk in a day. And then we're going to display that in total volume. And then it's going to tell us the recommended breed by name and give its rating and give its volume. So let's run that. So we don't, so we know we've got something horribly wrong there. Okay. We know we've got something terribly wrong. And where have we gone wrong? We've got all the V's where we don't need it. And the reason why is because we have done all of this in the while loop when we shouldn't have. So if we stop it and run it, we've got the right answer. So if you make that mistake like that, you're not going to get all the marks. You might get some, but you're not going to get all of it for that input. If you produce the input like that, exactly as is on the paper, bosh, you're done. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is all of those questions in the paper for the 2023 IGCSE Computer Science Paper 2 of 2023. Wow. How does that feel? I bet you must be having a really, having a sense of, oh, yeah, that was, that was really good. Yep. So that wraps our deep dive in the paper two of the NXL IGCSE Computer Science paper two. Yep. And before I go, I would like to give a special thanks to Af Asfa Af. Before I go, sorry. Before I go, I'd like to give a special thanks thanks to Asfan Awan, who used my email address I put on my YouTube channel to email me this past paper the data files and the mark scheme. So I really appreciate that, Afsan Darwan. So thank you very much for that. So that's my special thanks. So that, so anyway, anyway, I hope you found this video helpful and gained valuable insights to help you succeed in your exam. If you found these useful, found this walkthrough useful, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button for more content like this. Hit that notifications bell. And remember, practice will make perfect, especially in programming in any programming language. So keep revising, keep practicing, and you're well on your way to ace that exam. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now, and good luck. So please be sure to hit that like, and please also remember to hit that subscribe button. And another way to subscribe is to just click on this link, which is below each video I place. And if you like my content and you want to find out more about what I do, I've also got an online course called Introduction to Computer Systems on the Udemy website. So you just need to click on, click on it. And there we go. So this is my online course, Introduction to Computer Systems. So this is the landing page for that course. So in it, you will learn. So these are some of the things we'll learn. Like explaining the role of the central processing unit, describe the components of the CPU, provide an introduction to assembly language, which is low level programming, explain the factors that affect the performance of the central processing unit, and I've also put in a, another bit that I'm interested in the physics of overclocking the CPU, which may, may be develop an interest in electronics and also physics. So there's a lot, to, so there's a lot more to it than even I realized than we realized. So this is the course content. So you've got computer systems, so I'm introducing you to it. Then I'm going into the different forms of architecture and assembly language. Then I'm going into the factors that affect it and the physics of overclocking the CPU. And then I'm going into logic, so combinational logic systems, making the logic gates, sequential logic systems, semiconductors. Then I go into all things binary, where we introduce you to number systems, 
all the way down to doing binary and sound images and text. And then finally, we got input and output devices and the different forms of storage. So that's where memory will come in. And then my assessment is basically one big quiz of 30 questions. So you don't need any knowledge to do this course. All you need is a computer with stable internet connection. So that's all you really need there. And why you should do the course? Well, whatever I don't know, I'll go out and learn it. So the way my brain is wired is I'm on the autism spectrum. So it will be an asset in helping you get through the online courses that we provide. So we understand how to explain things in simple terms due to my teaching background. So you could think of us as a real life version of, say, Sheldon Cooper from Big Bang Theory, minus the rootless, or a C3PO, but without the glitches. So, I'm on the autism spectrum, so we're on the autism spectrum and have a rough idea on how to talk to, talk to them and relate to them. And my teaching style is that style I've crafted and one that works in a way that some people don't get if they only had tuition in the classroom or just want to, or just want to study the subject a lot more. So this course provides you with the opportunity to go further than you were in the subject that you want to pursue. So, so those are some of the reasons why you should, you should consider buying this online course. Because once you buy it, it's yours for a lifetime. For some of my videos, I will go through programming tasks. So if you want to do these yourself, I have put a REPL link below on my programming videos. So you just click on REPL. And this is what you need if you haven't signed up at all. So you just click sign up. If you've got an account, you just click log in. And once you've logged in or signed up, this is the page that will appear. So if I was to log in right now, this is the page. So this will appear. So that will be the page there. And in addition to all that, I am also a private tutor where I offer my private tutoring services specializing in ICT and computer science. And I look forward for you coming to me for lessons. Goodbye for now.